Good morning and welcome to the uh, Nothing About Us Without Us um, workshop, Engaging Transition Age Youth in Health Services. My name is Roger Daniels. I'm with Fred Lynch Youth and Family Services and Rising Heart Wellness Center is one of the programs that's a part of our agency. Um, my role as Senior Director is oversight of our community-based transition age youth programs, um, as well as Rising Heart Wellness Center. And I've been with the agency for almost 14 years um, and started uh, with responsibility for um, the clinic in, I think it was 2015, so almost six years ago. Um, I will turn it over to my other two presenters to introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Gabby. I'm an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, and I am a member of the Tay Advisory Council at Rising Heart Wellness Center, which is a clinic through the Fred French Youth and Family Services in Oakland. Good morning, uh, my name is Ramses Munoz. I'm the clinic coordinator slash health educator for the Rising Heart Wellness Center. And I've been with uh, Fred Finch uh, Youth and Family Services since 2014. Uh, and my main responsibilities are operations and providing um, health education and, and outreach. So we're really excited about today's presentation, which was uh, of the work that uh, we've been doing for the last uh, couple of years, especially with transition age youth. And um, in today's session, we're hoping to share a little bit about TAY access to healthcare and factors to consider. Um, we're definitely going to talk about the transition age youth advisory council, um, more affectionately known as the TAY Act. Uh, we'll give a little bit of Tay perspective um, in an interview, quote unquote, between Gabby and um, Ramses. And then we'll wrap up at the end of the session. So Ramses, if you can just talk a little bit about uh, the clinic, the services we provide, the populations we work with, um, that would be great. Yes. So um, Rising Heart Wellness Center um, has two main uh, populations um, uh, that we focus on. Um, we have the middle school slash high school over at Bret Hart Middle School. So that's uh, 12 to 18 year old. Um, there is a ninth grade that um, has a lot of uh, newcomers, the service as newcomer students. So that ninth grade turns into a variety, a, a, a high school, if you will. Um, for, for our students um, at Bret Hart, most of our services revolve around immunizations and sports physicals. Um, and a lot of assessment around behavioral health needs. <clears throat> and then we also focused on transitional age youth, otherwise we don't name them as Tay. Um, and that group can be anyone from uh, 16 to uh, 25. Um, and uh, that population um, can come with the same type of needs, um, but also um, we can experience more chronic health needs um, in that, yeah. Um, oh, go ahead. The, the other piece, uh, just to say a little bit more like generally about the clinic. So we are actually a school linked health center, which means that our clinic is actually on the Fred Finch campus. Um, and the primary school that we support is Bret Hart Middle School, which is next door to the campus. Um, Fred Finch is also the lead agency. And as some of you may be aware, we're actually a mental health and behavioral health organization. Um, and all that to say, uh, I think being a school linked health center kind of allows us to work more broadly in terms of the populations that we serve because we're not on a school site. It's also provided opportunities to do more integrated um, services, behavioral health and health. So a lot of our Fred Finch programs that work with Tay also have those Tay come to our clinic for their medical and dental services, um, which is also interesting because the populations that we tend to work with are those that have moderate to severe mental health challenges. So we've had to do some things as a clinic to adapt to that. And we'll talk more about that later on in the, um, in the presentation. 
I also just wanted to make sure that we know that we provide medical uh, services, dental services, uh, hearing, and uh, behavioral health. Okay. So um, this phrase, uh, nothing about us um, or without us, um, it's a, it really helps to define our approach in working with Tay and how to support them. Um, this phrase came out of the consumer peer movement um, within uh, mental health. Um, and it means that when uh, behavioral health systems um, make decisions about people living with uh, mental health or substance use challenges, that their voice is a part of the decision-making process. Um, and, and yeah, so this is where we'll talk more about um, how the TA Advisory Council uh, works to fulfill that. Yeah, and for us, this was definitely, uh, I think, foundational in terms of thinking about how we wanted to involve transition age youth, especially in service delivery uh, for the clinic. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the characteristics of transition age youth um, more broadly. Some of this may be familiar to some of you, um, starting with uh, the fact that developmentally 18 to 25 is a period of exploration and we think about it in terms of finding a life that fits. And so one of the key aspects of it is identity formation in many, on many different levels um, that they are trying to figure out, you know, who am I, who do I wanna be, what do I wanna do, um, that sort of thing. And probably some of you can remember back to your own experience uh, in this age range and trying to figure all that out. I think um, one of the big kind of tasks at this age is navigating the transitions. Um, we talk about work, school, and interpersonal relationships. Um, but I think kind of the overarching issue too is how you engage with the world as an adult versus a minor. Um, and I don't know that's, that, that that is something that always is really talked about to any extent. And as we get further into the presentation, you'll see how that impacts healthcare. Um, often the day that we work with are very present focus versus long-term planning, uh, you know, or considerations, um, which makes sense. You're at a point in your life where you really just want to be in the moment with most things. Um, there's also obviously a lot of peer influence that happens. And again, we'll, we'll connect that to healthcare more as we go through the presentation. But um, all that to say is often, you know, if you're an old guy like me, they're often not listening to what you have to say. They're listening to what their peers have to say. Um, and again, I think we've all kind of been there, done that. And then that sense of invincibility, um, which has both, you know, good and bad, the good being, you know, it can lead to a sense of exploration and curiosity, um, but sometimes it can also uh, put you in situations where you might think that you're invincible, but you're actually not. And I think the implications for all of these characteristics, um, the four main ones that I'll, I'll mention are one, I think healthcare tends to be a low priority compared to the other dimensions of their transition into adulthood. So, you know, the focus tends to be more on work, school, and interpersonal relationships versus actually thinking about healthcare and healthcare planning. Um, I think there's also a limited or, you know, lack of awareness of how the community will respond to you as an adult versus a minor. I know this comes up often with youth that have been in foster care and may have had experiences with um, the criminal justice system that may look very different as adults versus their experience as minors who were in residential or foster care. And sometimes I think that's not always talked about in terms of literally how the world will see you as an adult versus being a minor. Um, I think also for, uh, you know, adolescents transitioning into adulthood, chronic conditions or special health care needs um, may go unaddressed or inconsistently addressed because you don't have a parent or a support person or someone, 
you know, in the role of guardian to kind of remind you, you know, about things related to, let's say if you have diabetes or asthma, um, you know, those things may fall by the wayside when you become more responsible for your own healthcare. Um, and then the last one I mentioned um, already related to risk-taking, which I think um, is higher. Uh, and when you combine that with an awareness of the need for good healthcare being lower, you can see where that starts to be a little problematic. Um, so those are some of the things that I think come out of the characteristics of uh, being a Tay. And as I said later on in the presentation, we'll talk more about kind of the connections to healthcare and some of the barriers that come up um, as they relate to some of these things. Awesome. So uh, perfect transition to this next part. Um, so in terms of um, challenges that Tay face, it's important for us to in this effort to try to provide the best service possible, um, it's important to understand our population. Um, uh, and so some of the things that they, that what, what, that we know <clears throat> they can be dealing with in terms of the work that we've been providing uh, through Fred Finch, I mean, it's got over a hundred years of service. Um, we've learned that uh, tr they can come with a lot of trauma. Um, transition to adulthood, as Roger was saying, could be a big challenge. Um, there can also be uh, a lot of substance use uh, needs, um, lack of access to resources, um, and also just um, inform or being aware um, of what information is out there. Um, untreated or undertreated mental health needs um, and undiagnosed learning differences. Um, th these, these are some of the challenges that we know that the Tay population can come with. And so, what that means to us is um, here at the health center is um, to try to make sure that when they um, when they themselves call in or their uh, support staff call in uh, to find out um, how independent they are um, or if they're going to need additional support and how to be able to pro uh, include their support staff. Um, so making sure we get the release of information form, uh, authorized representative forms. Uh, all the contact information, a lot of our TAY, um, their phone uh, isn't as reliable. So having that contact information from their support staff is crucial so that once they be, they're established as a patient, we can have a, a up-to-date communication, a way to communicate with them. Um, but it also means working with, their, with the staff, uh, with the support staff to try to make sure and confirm that there's transportation or, or childcare, um, or to or to be present during an uh, an appointment. Um, a lot of the times, sometimes uh, our tays can have a lot of anxiety, especially with you know going to the dental uh, office. Like I, I still get nervous going to the dentist. So um, it's really uh, awesome to be able to bring the support staff with the patient, even give them a tour. Um, and so it's having that awareness. It's knowing that that. This are some of the challenges that our Tay population comes with, and so then how can we support them so they have uh, a good experience at the health center? Your your other one, uh, sorry, I realized I was muted. Um, is unstable housing. Um, a lot of our Tay, and again, this probably also reflects the population that you know Fred Finch is working with. Um, you know, often are in situations where the housing is either short term, it's tenuous, or they're unhoused. And so that's another factor um, that I think contributes to the ways that, you know, they are able to access and utilize healthcare. Um, and kind of the implications of all of these challenges are one that, uh, as you can imagine, it can be more difficult to engage Tay in healthcare services because aside from the things that are going on developmentally around the transition to adulthood when you add all these other things you know a history of trauma um, substance use which could be a form of self-medication um, related to trauma um, unstable housing the lack of access to resources um, all those things contribute to just more difficulty engaging in healthcare services um, it also can often lead to an inability to participate in healthcare decision making. 
So, you know, if you have an untreated or an undertreated mental health or health condition um, and you don't fully understand the ramifications of it or what the, you know, requirements are to manage it, um, it's hard to engage in the decision-making process around how to treat that particular condition. Um, undiagnosed learning differences also plays into that because, you know, aside from the anxiety of, you know, sometimes being put in positions where, you know, you're, you're made to feel like you're supposed to know stuff that you don't know, um, or you're supposed to be able to take things in that maybe you take in differently, um, also contributes to, you know, limited or lack of participation in healthcare decision-making. Um, but that also impacts treatment and medication adherence. Um, you know, if you don't, again, fully understand the ramifications of whatever your health condition might be, um, you know, you may not necessarily be that invested in adhering to whatever your doctor or nurse practitioner is telling you that you need to do, especially when you combine that with the developmental aspects of, again, the sense of invincibility kind of like peer influence, um, as well as being in the moment. Again, the healthcare piece is not always a high priority for Tay when you have all these um, competing factors. <clears throat> okay, so in terms of barriers to healthcare, and so how, putting, it all, putting all of this together, um, we, we understand that um, some of the main uh, barriers to healthcare can be lack of insurance, uh, misunderstanding of what is covered by insurance, um, historical and current precedent of how people of color, especially African Americans, have been treated by the medical system, um, stigma, uh, maybe more applicable to behavioral health uh, care, but it still applies, um, especially on like STIs and STD testing, uh, lack of awareness of education, <clears throat> meaning uh, signs and symptoms of illness. Um, and the lack of awareness of education, uh, uh, yeah, in terms of preventative care and reproductive health care. Um, the, the part around uh, the lack of insurance of uh, uh, awareness of insurance is really key. Um, what, so we're dealing with uh, transitional age youth and some, not all, can be former foster care um, uh, folk. And um, a lot of the times the adults were the ones kind of keeping the, uh, the healthcare information or the calling and making appointments and kind of carrying that care, um, all of a sudden to transition out, it's all just left up to the person. And so, you know, having those uh, skills to like negotiate or advocate um, is all of a sudden put onto the, the, our patient. And it's really important for us to know that, to be able to like, be able to uh, support them and ask more questions um, so that, it's an easier transition for them to be able to hold all of this. Um, and that's sometimes there's, um, some of our Tays have children. And so th there's a lot uh, of different peoples uh, within one family who, who have a lot of needs. Um, anything you'd like to add, Roger? Sure. Um, just, you know, the piece about stigma is a very big one in the mental health and behavioral health um, world in terms of transition age youth. And again, I think if you kind of relate back to your own experience, it, it was, it's always this interesting balance of you want to be a part of the group and an individual at the same time. Um, and so, you know, the, being someone who has to seek out health services or mental health services is that piece that can kind of set you apart in a way that you, you don't want to be set apart um, from your peers. You just want to be able to fit in. And so that's um, one reason. And again, you know, we'll talk more about the TAYAC um, in a few minutes, but I think part of it was trying to normalize the idea of like, how do we message and promote the clinic in a way that normalizes the idea of, yeah, healthcare is important whether you're 18 or 80. Um, and there's no, you know, stigma with coming to the clinic for services. You don't have to tell everybody your business about why you're there, but there doesn't have to be um, stigma associated with that. 
I think some other important points related to the barriers to healthcare and, and uh, Ramsey's touched on um, one of them, but you know, Tay tend to use a lot more emergency services. And again, that's kind of this, that kind of in the moment thing It's kind of like, yeah, I have this pain, but it's not preventing me from doing stuff I want to do. And then when it does get to that point, I'll just go to emergency services and kind of get that handled and then hopefully be, be done with it. Um, and so part of this is really trying to move the needle a little bit so that you're also engaging in preventative care as well. So maybe you don't have to actually wind up going to the emergency room for services. Um, I think for a lot of our transition age youth that we work with uh, here at Fred Finch that are living with mental health challenges, um, they haven't gotten consistent mental health care um, and accessing mental health care has been challenging as well, sometimes because of their presentation and you know fear and anxiety that healthcare providers might have in terms of, of working with those individuals. So they may have underlying conditions, as we, as we mentioned earlier, that are untreated or have um, not been treated fully. And then there's also the issue um, around Tay relying on peers, or um, as a lot of us do, I've definitely done it, you know, looking online for remedies or uh, to diagnose an illness. And again, trying to, you know, encourage Tay to actually talk to their health providers to get, you know, accurate information about whatever the condition is that they are, are dealing with. Um, and I think that also requires um, the provider to understand too that, you know, Yes, you're dealing with an adult, but you may also be dealing with an adult who's very unfamiliar, as we, we talked about, for all kinds of reasons with navigating the healthcare system, um, which kind of leads me to the fourth point, which is, you know, a lot of these barriers to healthcare um, occur because there's lack of healthcare planning um, as part of the transition from pediatric care to adult care. Um, so with pediatric care, as Ramses was talking about, there's more potential family involvement or caregiver involvement um, around import appointments and reminding you to, you know, take your medication, whatever that might, medication might be for. Um, whereas when you become part of the adult healthcare system, it becomes much more individualized and requires more self-advocacy on your part. And if you haven't had conversations, hopefully with your provider before you transition to the adult care system about what that means and how you have to engage with the system and kind of what your rights are. And, you know, for example, that, you know, if you are feeling like you need to be seen by someone who's a specialist in a certain area, you may actually have to request and advocate for that. Your doctor may not necessarily put that forward as an option for you. But that's something that, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily go into it knowing that. And so that lack of, you know, healthcare planning during that transition from pediatric care to adult care is also something that, you know, kind of exacerbates all the different things we were talking about in terms of barriers that Tay experienced um, with regard to healthcare. Thank you, that was great. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so ways to support our Tay patients. Um, it's, it's based on like what everything that Roger just mentioned, it's super, super important uh, for us to be, all, especially at the front end, but, but all the way to the back um, in the health center, um, making sure that the staff is trained properly and, and made aware of all these different things, all these challenges that our population might come with. Um, I think it's really crucial, um, especially how Roger framed it in that uh, pediatric care can come with specific focuses and adult care um, for sure for us presents differently. And so, um, so that's why it's super important for us to be friendly and caring, compassionate. Um, and uh, yeah, just no, presenting, providing the, the services in the most neutral way possible. Um, 
it's important to reframe challenges um, as through like a survival promotion lens um, and encourage um, our patients to be hopeful and um, provide, you know, hopefully they're resilient. Um, use non-blaming and non-judgmental communication. Um, it's also really important for us to uh, uh, ask about uh, preferred pronouns um, and um, how ready someone might want to identify and, and to work with our patients. Um, and there's ways to capture that information in our records system um, so that people see are, uh, are seen fully and as who, how they want to present at the health center. Um, we try to use motivational um, interviewing techniques, um, asking open-ended questions um, and using reflective listening, um, especially understanding of Tay culture, music, fashion, social media, norms and behavior. Um, this is why it's important that we also try to uh, work with younger people and um, bring in uh, interns uh, who uh, have a better sense of what Tay may be going through um, and why it's important that we um, uh, provide services um, directly with uh, transitional age youth. Um, and you'll get to learn more uh, from our uh, previous uh, uh, Tay member, Gabby. She'll be able to share some of her experiences, but um, so that we can be able to get information and, and, and influence how we provide that service, how we deliver our services. Um, Roger, anything else? Yeah. Oh, I was, yeah, just going to say that motivational interviewing um, is one of our foundational practices generally for how we communicate regarding um, the process of change and recovery for Tay that are in our behavioral health and mental health programs. But I think more broadly, it's also um, a good model because it really can help you understand how to connect based on where someone is in their process of change. Um, and obviously a big part of what we've been talking about with regard to Tay is a huge change in terms of this transition from uh, you know, being a minor to being an adult. And so I think motivational interviewing um, some of you may be familiar with it, but if not, that's one particular model that I think can, um, or one particular approach that I think can be really helpful in terms of just how we do some of these things that um, Ramses was describing around, you know, being curious, but non-blaming, non-judgmental. Um, and I think the trauma-informed piece of reframing around you know, the challenges that a lot of our Tay have experienced is really important. Again, you know, with the particular population that we've served, um, I think it's really helpful to acknowledge their strengths and to talk about their experiences in terms of things they've been able to do to sustain themselves from a survival perspective. And I think, you know, you can put health and access to health care in that kind of frame, you know, in terms of wanting to basically get access to the things that are going to help them be healthier, help with improve well-being, and that sort of thing. Um, so those are, are two, I think, really important, or three really important aspects of ways to support Tay uh, in terms of reframing the challenges, using the non-blaming and non-judgmental communication, um, and using motivational interviewing as a, a, an approach to how to uh, connect with tech. So in terms of what we've learned in the five years, um, going on, yeah. And working with these different populations. Um, so I, some of the things that we've already mentioned, flexibility is key um, as opposed to major, you know, hospitals or the emergency room, which a lot of our Tay tend to leave their healthcare to. <clears throat> it's so important that we talk about this, that we provide this training to all staff, uh, our medical providers, our dental providers, um, that we approach uh, the way we provide, we deliver the service, um, being flexible. And we might have a 30 minute appointment planned or a, <clears throat> uh, an hour 
Um, but being flexible and knowing that, you know, um, this might take a lot longer uh, or it might not go the way we planned. Um, my team may be, might get ups, upset. Um, and so just being aware that there's a lot of other things that our tape population may present with, uh, or maybe holding. Um, and, and that's just um, not to say that the middle school or the pediatric services are, don't have that, um, but it is different. Um, our Tay are in a, in a, dealing with a lot of other needs and pressures. Um, so because of that, um, for some of our Tay who may need more support, we've learned um, that one way to try to include um, support staff um, that they have or a case manager that they're working with who they've built rapport and uh, they trust them, um, they, they know their, uh, what triggers them uh, or anxieties, um, it's important to involve their support staff. And so part of our registration process that's different from the middle schoolers uh, or the pediatric services is that we include a release of information form in the registration packet, um, but also um, a representative uh, authorizing, authorization form so that we can have um, support staff and um, also set up appointments for them um, or, or visit the, the clinic with them um, so that the patient can ultimately feel relaxed and um, secure that everything is gonna go well. Um, we also, a lot of our take can come with a lot of psychiatric needs uh, and it's important that we we know so that we're not um, double referring for services, you know, to get assessed. Um, it's important to know everything uh, at the at, from the get go. Um, this helps us uh, figure out. It helps our medical providers, especially, figure out how they're going to uh, provide services to our patients. Um, Self medication is also very prevalent. Um, so our TAs, uh, as opposed to the middle schoolers, um, they can definitely come under the influence. Um, and so it's, it's really up to our providers um, to figure out how comfortable they are and if they, can, if the, if they feel like the, the patient is hearing and can understand what's happening, great. Uh, we're a little bit more careful when it comes to dental just because there's sharks and more, it's more detailed work. Um, but it's always good as uh, we, overall, we use these opportunities so that um, if we, or any of our providers notice anything that they uh, let me know and, or, or someone else know so that we can have a conversation with our participant. But it, it's, it's knowing all of these factors um, and being open to these uh, realities that makes the difference and makes the connection uh, and allows our, hopefully, the Arte can see um, that we're willing to work with them um, as opposed to other more um, larger hospitals uh, who may be more strict um, or might not take the time to really understand um, or be more flexible uh, around timing uh, and those sort of things. Um, yeah, the, the one thing I would add is also the benefit of the coordination of care um, piece with other providers is that, uh, you know, sometimes Tay, um, and I don't, I, this, I don't know, is necessarily unique to Tay, but um, sometimes are poor historians of kind of things that may be helpful for the provider to know in terms of the kind of treatment or medication or whatnot um, that they're recommending. So having, you know, whether it's a case manager, a support person, um, whatever the case may be, having that flexibility to have someone else in the room who may be able to fill in gaps or provide additional information is really important and again that's something um, that I think also for providers of service um, to understand especially because you know adult care does tend to focus on the individual so you know the idea of having another person in the room who's not the patient um, may be a little uncomfortable 
um, for the provider because that's not, you know, that may not typically be what, what their experience is. But um, I think often that can be super helpful. And we as an organization are also exploring other ways to make um, health center providers a part of the actual treatment team. So for example, looking at our consents for treatment and whether or not we can actually add um, our medical and dental provider to that consent so that it's much easier to share information between the behavioral health provider and the health provider. Um, just as another way of trying to make sure that the medical and dental staff have the information they need to accurately assess um, and treat whatever is being presented by the TA when they come in for their appointments. Okay, and um, at, we also would like to highlight our transitional age youth um, advisory council. <clears throat> so yes, yes, it was. Um, so uh, Gabby was a part of the most recent cohort, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what we've learned from the first one we had and up to now. So some of the successes so far um, is that we developed in um, um, uh, curriculum um, based on the, 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 the interests of our, of our members. Uh, we really took the time to understand um, what we all, we had ideas, but it was um, nothing like getting their feedback and really adopting and, and making sure that that was a part of it and we, that we captured their needs. Um, um, and uh, we developed a, a health fair. Um, so that was really fun. Uh, and uh, we did it in the, in the rain, so that was interesting, but it was a huge turnout. Uh, we had tons of uh, sponsors and people who showed up from the community, uh, community orgs, uh, who also work with uh, Tay. Um, we even had a, a pet, uh, a petting area of like dogs. It was, it was amazing. Um, all, all of this um, proved to really uh, help in uh, uh, promoting our services, but making a connection with uh, our TAs in a different setting other than just, you know, seeing them in the clinic and, um, and for healthcare reasons. Um, uh, what else? So, so the main purpose of the, the advisory council um, is, was to be able to uh, have a, a interaction and an opportunity uh, to get feedback from our tape participants, whether they were our patients or not. Um, and, um, and in this way, put them through certain topics around healthcare or, or again, around needs that were specific to Tay and uh, have a conversation and have a dialogue and, and try to uh, gather as much information to have it be uh, reflective of what is what are the realities that Tay are living with. Um, and how can the health center be a resource to address those needs? Definitely the healthcare part of it. Um, oh, 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 we're interested in growing more uh, opportunities um, that we might not are, you know, have thought about yet. Um, so it, it can go in so many directions, uh, hopefully, you know, whether it's about providing uh, opportunities within art um, or, you know, dance or, um, providing some sort of lab, uh, computer lab. There's so many ways that we could go, but this is just the beginning. Um, anything you wanted to add, Roger? Uh, sure. I just sure. wanted to also emphasize that, that uh, you know, the, the Tay Act was also a great way to engage uh, the Tay served by Fred Finch in accessing healthcare. And so being able to um, do more presentations to staff and participants and come up with, you know, promotional material, um, because for a lot of the Tay that we work with, uh, as I said earlier, often um, they are definitely in need of access to healthcare. Um, and so that is also, I think, one of the things that has been more successful. And there were a few challenges along the way in terms of, for example, logistics um, around finding ways to get TAE to campus um, for our first TAEAC. 
Um, and we tried to be creative using, you know, some of the services like Uber and Lyft. Um, there was also participant engagement, uh, which was a bit of a challenge, sometimes for good reason, because, you know, when they started the process with the Tay Act, maybe they weren't in school um, and then they were in school. And so the scheduling of the Tay Act meetings and trying to work around um, the changing schedules uh, was a bit of a, a bit of a challenge. Um, and then just trying to come up with a process for Tay to apply for the Tay Act, but not making it so convoluted and difficult that, you know, either people didn't apply or, you know, they applied, but it wasn't really that helpful because the information we got um, as part of thinking through like the grouping for the Tay Act uh, wasn't very helpful. So um, in our Tay Act too, uh, which was in 2020, I think we uh, learned a few lessons about how to um, improve that process. So in terms of um, our TAG for the summer of 2000, um, some things that were a success um, is that we increased take community knowledge about our health center. Uh, by this time, we had already started a lot more uh, presentations uh, presentations about our services, but also presentations about um, topics that um, were important to, to Tay um, at, the, at a variety of different Tay serving agencies in the community. Uh, we partnered up with a, a, a key groups of people uh, and agencies, uh, but we provided a lot of workshops on, on um, reproductive health, um, reproductive anatomy, um, sexuality, um, substance use. Um, and ways that we could connect about real topics that were important to our Tate population. Um, and, and by covering these topics, and not just covering them, but like also covering them in a really neutral way, in a very harm reductionist approach, it allowed the Tate to see us that if these are their educators and these are the people promoting the services that um, hopefully, you know, that, that uh, not judgment uh, judgmental approach would also carry to the health center and um, that was really important. Um, um, we also gained a lot more application so um, this time around uh, we were able to like fine-tune uh, more our message and also because we uh, had more staff we were able to spend more time and uh, really working on some relationships and um, contacts that we had and um, the, the having that consistency really helped, um, which, yeah, so that definitely helped us. Um, and then the, having had done this work, then we were able to gather more information about our tape population um, and learn about more of their needs. Um, Roger, you wanna? Yeah, I think in the, in the interest of time, um, I will, skip over the challenges. I think, you know, they're pretty clearly laid out in terms of, you know, dealing with COVID and having to make some major changes actually to how we were going to do the TAYAC. Um, I did want to add that one of the things too, I think that was a big part of the conversation was the integration of social determinants of health, specifically as it relates to social justice and racial justice. Um, our facilitator, um, I think, did an excellent job of altering some of the curriculum to accommodate for that because literally right in the middle of kind of the TAYAC process, which was from April to August, um, a lot of things were blowing up socially. And so bringing that into the conversation, I think, um, was really good. Um, so, uh, Ramses, do you want to... Oh, one other thing. So I think we'll try to save questions for the last five minutes. Initially, we were gonna try and take questions now, but I really wanna give Gabby an opportunity to um, share her experience. And so uh, I will hand it over to Aranzis to introduce this portion of the workshop. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> So this is great. Um, uh, Gabby, again, do you wanna introduce yourself for the people who might have uh, joined after you introduce yourself and yeah. just tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. 
I'm Gabby. I'm an undergrad here at UC Berkeley, and I'm also a former member of the Tay Youth Advisory Board. Um, yeah, that's my introduction. Awesome. So um, in this section, I'm going to ask Gabby a couple of questions, um, and sh uh, she'll be able to provide us her amazing uh, experience. So. Um, uh, Gabby, can you explain to us, um, can you describe a time, um, uh, one of your more memorable healthcare experiences and why was it so memorable? Why did it stand out? Okay, so I have a positive and negative experience that were memorable. I'll start off with the positive and the positive is with my psychiatrist who is very friendly and is very um, caring when it comes to me and if I ever need referrals to anybody like she knows where to send me to and um, she's very knowledgeable when it comes to my insurance which is very helpful because once I became an adult and got my insurance through school I sure I had insurance but I had no clue how to use it so it kind of countered the fact that I had insurance because if I don't know how to use it then what good is it going to do for me um, and so I really appreciated that knowledge she had on my health insurance because it reduced the burden that I was essentially given um, due to my lack of like experience with healthcare. And um, on top of that, when I was doing medication, um, taking medication, she um, made sure to explain to me what I was taking, um, possible side effects, um, why she suggested I take it, and also gave me like the power to choose to say no to that, even after she explained um, why it would be beneficial. So I really appreciated that rather than being like, you should take this or here, take this, here's a prescription, go, that's it. Um, so I really appreciated that and that she's always um, kind of very knowledgeable on things that don't even really pertain to psychiatric um, care, which I think is a very holistic approach and um, beneficial for Tay. Um, and my negative experience was when I was probably like 16, 17 before I um, legally became an adult and my primary care physician asked if I had been using drugs. I explained to her which ones I had interacted with and used already. And she simply said, that's bad, don't do that, rather than taking a harm reduction approach where she could have said, well, here are some mental health resources. Because at the time I was using um, drugs to cope with mental health issues that I was dealing with. So um, Reflecting back, I don't think that she was fulfilling her job duties because she wasn't really taking a harm reduction approach that could have in the long run benefited me. Um, I think if she really cared about my health, she would have um, met me with empathy and with resources on how to um, recover from using drugs. Um, so I think rather than scolding me, she could have took that approach. And um, I think a harm reduction way is more um, beneficial than saying simply drugs are bad. Um, like, thank you. That's what everybody says. But how am I, what am I supposed to do if I don't have mental health resources or even know where to start, which in this case, she didn't refer me anywhere. Thank you, Gabby. Um, another question is when you think about using healthcare, a healthcare provider, um, what types of services um, are you hoping that they offer? Um, ideally, I would want a healthcare provider to be like a one stop shop where I can just um, like go and get all of my needs addressed. Um, since transportation is a huge issue, specifically for me, I don't own a car. And BART is sometimes really expensive, in my experience. So um, yeah, I think that's like one thing I would hope for like services to be offered, like information on how to get to a location, either driving or with public transportation, walking, et cetera. And if there's not a direct, like if there's not a service that whatever particular clinic or healthcare provider can't provide me with, I expect them to be able to refer me to somebody who can. Um, and I think it would be helpful for 
them to like, like I said, give me information on how to arrive to the place, maybe like give a picture of what the clinic looks like. I usually get off the bus and I'm like, I don't know where to go. I don't know what I'm looking for, which takes up time from my appointment sometimes considering that um, public transportation isn't really um, strict on their time that they give that of arrival. So um, yeah, and like I said, the other thing of having like a one-stop shop is really helpful. And for Tay who have um, their own children, I think maybe having like um, on on site some sort of kind of like how 24 hour fitness has, or previously before COVID they had where your kids can go and stay downstairs while you're working out, maybe something of that nature, because there are Tay who have um, kids of their own and um, that kind of hinders their ability to go to their appointments if they don't have somebody to take care of their kids. It costs money to take care of kids. So if that's not available, it's difficult. And that ultimately poses a huge barrier to healthcare. Thank you, Gabby. Um, last question. Um, and thank you for everything you're letting us know at this point, it's awesome. Uh, what do you wish you had known before your first interaction with a healthcare system as an adult? Um, I guess, how to navigate health insurance. Um, that's something that I sometimes still struggle with along with my friends who are also Tay. Um, we're always trying to like put together what we find online um, with like out the help of healthcare providers. Um, so I think maybe like having some health insurance literacy would be like very beneficial so that I'm like fully taking advantage of what my insurance covers. Um, because I know some people just have insurance and it's like, yeah, I have insurance because it's mandated under like ACA, but I don't know how to use it. So it's really does no good if you don't know how to navigate your health insurance. Um, and I think that like having other knowledge on other sort of resources such as like Medi-Cal and how to get that maybe like EBT is like something that I wish I had like known and also understanding that um, medicine is usually trying to address a problem after the problem has got there when there's preventative measures that can occur so I think another thing that I had wish I, that I had known is understanding that there's a lot of ways to prevent things from happening, like having a good diet, sleeping enough, addressing mental health issues before you get to that really low point. Um, and yeah, and I think how to navigate dental care, because I know wisdom teeth is a big thing at this age and expensive. So I know when I was dealing with that, I was like, this is very expensive. Did not know I need to pay for Anastasia. Um, for, like for my mouth, which is, I don't know, $300 sometimes. So that can be very costly. So I think um, I sometimes wish I would like just get some sort of um, price that I can get before I kind of go into it. And then I'm just given a bill and I'm like, dang, how am I gonna pay for this? So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think overall though, definitely some healthcare literacy and in insurance. Thank you, Gabby, so much. We really appreciate um, all this information you've pr provided to us. And just uh, lastly, just want to summarize that uh, Gabby was a part of our most recent cohort. Um, it was facilitated by Megan Abril, who's now a uh, behavioral health uh, provider with us. Um, there was originally five participants, and we, um, but Gabby is the one who was able to help us and present with us. Um, and yeah. Um, if there's any questions, hopefully you can put them in the chat. Thank you so much, Gabby. Uh, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, this is this was awesome. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Um, we included this just to give some perspective on the impact that the work that we've done around promotion and outreach and the TAYAC has had in terms of uh, the percent of appointments for Tay. And as you can see in January, when we had minimal um, activity, uh, well, zero. And in July, in the midst of our first Tay Act, uh, we had a significant increase um, as we did more outreach and promotion 
And then again, in January, it was uh, still fairly high um, coming off of the uh, health fair and the continued promotion, um, both internally and externally, we were doing around health healthcare services available through the clinic. Um, I just wanted to say that it's, and this is why it's really important to try to have um, funding, whether it's in grants um, or elsewhere, uh, to try to have staff dedicated to, um, for us at least it's work to, to dedicate someone specifically to Tay. Um, because it involves its own education, its own curriculum, its own approach, uh, the amount of time to outreach to the population um, and, and the work uh, and the, the relationships uh, with certain other TAY serving um, agencies in the community who are gonna refer to you and uh, you have to attend certain meetings and part of so, uh, the TAY network, if you will. Um, yeah. um, yes. So I um, wanted to take the last, I think it's five minutes to um, open it up to any questions. I'll just say quickly this last slide. Um, we included this uh, with some things to consider on your part if you are thinking about um, serving Tay. Um, just some questions to begin the conversation within your own organization. Um, if this is something you're thinking about doing. So on that note, um, Nina, were there any questions? No questions so far, just amazing comments about how they love your presentation and um, especially the part with youth input of what I wish I knew or had offered to me. Cool, thanks. Awesome. Well, great. I think um, if there are no questions, uh, unless there are any final comments, um, I think that concludes our presentation. I just wanted to add um, for any of those uh, people in the audience and uh, other agencies thinking about trying to work uh, or starting TACE uh, programs or TACE services, um, it's, it's so important to really listen to the patient population or the uh, uh, participants in, in the programming um, to try to provide services in the most authentic way possible. Um, it, it's, it's crucial, it's so important. So um, we're really thankful for Gabby to join us, not only to have done, to, to have been a member of the TAAC, but also to uh, present with us here today. It's, it's so important. Thank you, Gabby. Yeah, I want to second that. Um, and it just, I, I feel like what came through loud and clear is that, you know, as providers, there's more to the services than just the medical and dental. There is definitely a piece of it that is really involving, you know, education, nurturing, helping um, folks who are new to adult care with navigating the system, everything from insurance to, you know, explaining why it is you're prescribing, what it is you're prescribing, um, why it is you're recommending the treatment that you're um, recommending, um, especially if you want the young person to be invested in their health care and to really, you know, quote unquote, adhere to whatever the treatment process is. And I think the other piece that's really important to hold is the resource piece and you know whether it's the provider giving the resource or whether you have like a resource guide within your um, clinic lobby that you can direct people to but something that will help you know young adults kind of navigate the resources that they need um, in order to improve their wellness and well-being so thank you gabby so much for just uh giving some reality to all the things that we talked about prior to to your comments, I really appreciate that. Thank you, I really appreciate um, including the voices of Tay and like actually trying to understand their needs. Nothing about us without us, that's what we're all about. <laughs> nice, thank you, Nina. Thank you, Nina.
Yes. We're done. Uh, did we get like, how do you know that? 